Hello and welcome to Capes, Cowls and Masks, the show where we uncover the world of soups and science fiction. And this is our first Filmmakers Special. I'm today's host, David Osger. I'm a writer and a multimedia journalist and I'm joined by this episode's co-host... Jake Hart. I'm also a writer on the Fresh Take Hub and a podcaster myself. And Dave, I've been across the country this week. I'm so tired. Mm. I've been to London, I've been to Cardiff, I've been to Bristol and to Arrakis on all three of those occasions. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm worn out after this week. Jake, Jake is like perfectly understands the medium of like film now just purely from the screen sizes he's seen. He's like literally gone like down and down and down. And he's like, these are all the formats you can watch. And I'm going to be able to go to like an executive or CEO and explain the benefits of all of them. (laughs) I can't wait to watch uh, Dune on my Apple Watch as Villeneuve intended as well. That's going to be the next one. Yeah, this is actually it. It has timed quite nicely for you, hasn't it? Like the filmmaker special has like literally got like you know one of your favorite filmmakers and films uh, at the moment, which is such a like ode to cinema that this has landed in in this week. So, yeah, expect lots of uh, links to Dune from Jake during this uh, <laughs> during this episode. <laughs> It's like, so what do you guys think about like realistic down to earth stories? And Jake's like, well, in Dune. <laughs> <laughs> In this other planet that doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> well, well, I was having a spice stream the other day, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, we we look forward to it, Jake. And uh, yeah, as we are, you know, as we previously mentioned, today's episode we are talking all about making movies in the age of comic book movies, social media, and with more reviewers and expectations than ever. We ask, is it really that easy to make a film work? Especially have you has you have so many people these days who are kind of like, oh, this sucked, this person's terrible, all of that kind of stuff. But you know, I think you need to hear from filmmakers themselves as to this can be quite a you know a, a tough job sometimes, and sometimes that magic can happen. Sometimes it doesn't always work out. Uh, so you know, who better to join us than two filmmakers, two guests? We both know the trials and tribulations of making films, especially comic book media, having both made uh, DC short films. So first off, uh, we have Rob Ayling, who has joined us before. He is a filmmaker and comic book nerd and also uh, supports me a lot on social media by pointing out all the places I appear. So thank you, Rob. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, do excuse my voice. It's a little bit croaky today, but um, otherwise uh, I'm fine. And you're very welcome, David, as well. <laughs> that was like amazing to see that on Lad Bible, your comment about the Penguin and uh, the Batman trailer. I, I literally had to message to Aiken you straight away like, He's done it. He's, yeah. he's got there. He's got there. I like this. <laughs> I, it, it was weird because I actually did. I made it and I kind of looked at like the hashtag or penguin and I was coming up as like on the top. I was like, oh, that's a good sign. So obviously, yeah, it worked. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And obviously you said they, uh, you're a bit croaky voice because you've just been to MCM Comic Con. So uh, tell us all about that. Uh, yeah. So um, th- we were at MCM Comic Con uh, for the last couple of days. Uh, on Friday, we screened uh my batman fan film living in crime alley um michael Aji um presented it and hosted the panel q a session and um yeah we screened in front of a live audience for like the third time in the space of a couple of years which is kind of crazy when you think about it because um you know like over the last tw- uh, you know since the last year obviously with the pandemic and everything we haven't had live events we haven't had comic book conventions and so this was the first one that they've had in the last two years. And to see the film being played there and have the audience there and enjoying it. Well, I hope they were enjoying it and they applauded. Uh, <laughs> they were being polite, maybe. Um, but no, they, they seem to really enjoy the film. And, you know, they had some questions and getting to talk with the fan community again. And, you know, I'm, it's just so good to interact with people again face to face and just experience conventions uh, again, um, as well as the arts themselves, like Jake mentioned um, watching June the other day. I shared that experience with him at the IMAX. And, you know, it was just great seeing a capacity of fans just enjoying something again. And um, But, yeah, MCM was epic. It was just a wonderful way to um, share the film to uh, the fan community again and uh, give it a new audience as well. So, yeah, it was um, surreal but amazing. Yeah, it does make a big difference, doesn't it? When you're not just kind of seeing Zoom screens or like 
when I saw the pictures you posted and it's like you're seeing people cosplay and you're like, oh my God, you know, this was a thing, you know, when it's not just people online or like virtual events or even when it is other events that have happened since and you just see like a bunch of people who are like in like little booths or separated and fenced off with masks on, you know, we're at that stage now in which people are able to, you know, mix and, and able to act as they did before, of course, still safely and, you know, pending that they've done the necessary checks and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's that kind of stuff that makes it feel like it used to, I guess. So, um, Rob, uh, as this is the filmmaker special, uh, we thought that this would be a good chance just to get a flavor as who you are as a filmmaker and a film fan. Uh, we just want the one film that you think is like your all time favorite, which is kind of encapsulate you as a fan and a creator, I guess. Um, see, this is always a really tough one, but I think if I just have to pick one right now, I, I won't go for the most obvious one, which I always say. Um, but I will go with the apartment for me. The apartment is a timeless classic, um, just in terms of its, um story but also in, in its filmmaking as well it's it's as the tagline says there's nothing quite like the apartment otherwise wise or cookie wise you know and even from 1960 till now it's still a timeless classic in my opinion like just pure cinema at its finest yeah great choice it's always good to have those uh those are kind of classics of cinema, etc. Like you, you know your Hitchcocks and yeah, of course like Billy Wilder, etc. So good choice there, Rob. Uh, so we now go to our next guest, uh, who we've uh, wanted to have on for quite a while. She uh, is her first time on Capes, Cows, and Masks. She is a fellow filmmaker and founder of Triskel Pictures. It is Sophie Black. Hello, Sophie. Hello. Thanks for having me. No problem. So yeah, we thought, uh, like I said, we got Rob, who's uh, done a Batman fan film, and uh, we were saying before the show there was that kind of you know relation that you already have in that you have something in common as you've done uh growing shadows which is a poison ivy fan film yes we're both from the east midlands as well we are the two east midlands filmmakers who have made dc fan films so and they came out around the same kind of time as well and they've been in the same festival so yeah our films are friends but we've only met today so yeah it's great to see him doing so well uh, yeah, bringing people together on Caves, Cows and Masks. We'd love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Sophie, please uh, tell us, you know, you were saying actually before we were recording as well about how things have now kick-started a bit more with work, ex- which is great for the film industry. So, you know, tell us about, you know, what have you been up to recently? How have things been back, you know, since the easing of restrictions in terms of, you know, starting new projects or hopefully starting new things in the future, etc. How How has that all been? Oh, it, it, it's amazing and exhausting in equal measure. What what I hate is, is saying no to stuff that you really want to do has been a pain in the bum because I remember this time last year, back in August, even having to do sales calls, like, do you want a video? Do you want a video? And no one wanted a video. And it was kind of a, it was such a scary time. And now everyone wants a video on, on the same day. <laughs> and, and, I, and there's some jobs that I really want to do. and I, I want to do most jobs that I do. I'm so lucky. And yeah, how to turn stuff down. It's a nice place to be in, but it's also just, yeah, I want to do everything I can in life. And yeah, it's quite sad when you, you can't do everything, but um, it is such an exciting time. And it's so great to see everyone getting work again and all the filmmakers back on set and doing what they are born to do and no one's struggling anymore. And it, it it's just a joy, not just seeing myself doing well, but seeing all these amazing filmmakers doing well. And that's that's brilliant. Um and like outside of the the day job, which is also filmmaking, outside of the day job filming, there's also the fact that um, back in in uh, April 2020, my team and I finally finished work on a film called Lepidopterist, which is a sci-fi film about a scientist who smuggles something out of a lab in a large box. And I won't give away what's in that box because that's quite worth seeing in the film. But she has a bit of a race against time as her colleagues at the lab try and track her down and get that box back. So it's quite tense. And it's a really sweet little film. Um, but what's what's made the film so special is not just the film itself, which you know we all love. It's the fact that Obviously, the pandemic happened basically the moment we finished the film. We submitted it to our first festival and a week later, the festival shut and postponed and was gone. So we were finished the film and then we we, we couldn't get it out to audiences. And that's why we make films. And 
as Rob said, what happened then was, you know, a year of, well, half a year of nothing because there was no festivals at all. And then we had the online festivals and it was great to, to share the film with the audiences, but I didn't have the clapping emojis, but I did have buffering, which is <laughs> so destroying when you're trying to watch a film, for showing it for the first time to people when it buffers is just so sad and so tiny, such tiny screens. And we finally had our first physical screening in September this year, which is a year and a half after the film was finished. And it, it was just brilliant. And we've got another screening coming up on an IMAX screen in November. And I will be plugging that one later. And that will only be the, the film's third time on a big screen. Uh, and we shot it in 2019. So it, it's just, it's taken so long to get it out. And it's, it, it's great. It, yeah, it's just been such a joy to show it now. I had my first in-person interview about the film on Thursday this week. That's the first time I'd been out and actually promoted it with a person rather than just tweeting about it. And it was so exciting. I think I just chewed that guy's ear off. I was like, let me tell you everything about my film because this is probably going to be the only physical interview. And I've been doing this a long time. And back in 2012, when we had films to promote, we'd be everywhere. My filmmaker colleagues and I would be we're just traveling around and going to festivals and screenings and, and being on TV and going and promoting the film. And it was so exciting. And Having only done it once now is is so surreal. But same time, like I said, I'm not I'm not complaining. I'm just happy to be out there talking about films again. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah, you're you're like a journalist dream because I know often you know we can feel like kind of people just like oh they don't you know we're bugging them or like you're sort of like getting on their nerves. Especially sometimes if it can be somebody who's like a creative or involved in like a project or something like that because it's like that's not the thing that they want to do they want to create and stuff like that it's like the, the negative part of it's like when you see people doing the press runs like when the stars have to sit down and answer like the same questions to the same people all the time you're like ah oh, that's like probably one of the negatives of the job so yeah no, you, you get the opposite problem of me you have to kind of chuck me out like <laughs> the one I did on Thursday I was like are you sure are you done can I talk about my film some more they're like no no we're done get out yeah go <laughs> so yeah love to hear it um so yeah, well, I'm sure we'll uh, hear all about uh, more about filmmaking and uh, some of your films as we uh, come across some of our questions and topics that we're going to talk about today. And uh, same question to you as well, Sophie, in terms of the type of filmmaker you are and you know your your tastes. What is your all time favorite film? Ah, it's an obvious one, and I apologize for my obvious choice, but it's still Lord of the Rings as one film. It's the film that made me want to be a filmmaker in the first place, and Peter Jackson is my hero. Uh, and Fellowship of the Ring turns 20 in in December and I still remember that you know my reaction to seeing the film I still remember how much Return of the King just floored me I was talking to my dad yesterday about this because I saw Return of the King and I was just in floods afterwards and he, he, he couldn't console me and he was like what's up is it because the film was so emotional and I said no I'm really upset because we're never going to see a film that good again <laughs> and I just couldn't get over it young me was just devastated and I keep trying to have something meet that expectation of me and it it hasn't but I'm on the journey I am because of Peter Jackson and because of Lord of the Rings so I owe it everything but you know, slight side shout out also to Moulin Rouge is my second favorite film and it also turned 20 this year so we're getting old <laughs> yeah but it's really exciting well, it's good timing as well because we were talking earlier about like moving and everything like that and this current time next to me i have a lego uh, gandalf so you know you oh, the proof, hey, the proof of that as well rob i don't have a lego apartment uh minifig unfortunately but... i mean the, the fact they haven't done that already is this is an absolute travesty in its own right so uh, one yeah, day it's criminal. it's criminal they've done si seinfeld you never know uh, yeah true true, true. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, on to today's show, uh, like I said, where we're talking all about making movies, you know, our, our experiences and then how that kind of reflects on the bigger movies that we get, um, but also like the smaller films and how it reflects on people's reactions to them, how it maybe changes our opinions and how maybe those films turn out the way they do, which I don't think a lot of people take into mind when they're watching something and they say, oh, they did this, they did that. And it's like, well, maybe there's a reason for why that didn't turn out. And maybe that filmmaker wasn't happy with it themselves. But then there's also the flip side of when things go miraculously well. Um, and that is just, you know, purely down to people's hard work, which at the end of the day, I think 99% of the industry will be like hardworking individuals. 
Um, on that note, uh, before we start uh, talking about the art of filmmaking, uh, it would seem wrong not to pay tribute to cinematographer uh, Helena Hutchins, who tragically died last Thursday while on the set of the film Rust. Uh, she was accidentally shot by a prop firearm. Uh, many media outlets have run the story with images and headlines of the actor involved in the incident, uh, talking about the crew member who died. Um, but, you know, we wanted to take this moment to say that that crew member had a name and it was Helena Hutchins, an award winning, winning cinematographer who to many will hopefully be remembered for her work and not just her death. Uh, so just to you guys, is there anything, you know, you wanted to add to that? I know you were saying earlier, Rob, about how it reminded you of other similar events that have happened in in the film industry before i mean there's not much really i can say it's just that it should never have happened to be honest with you you know health and safety is first and foremost the most important thing on any film set and the fact that this is now this is one of many sadly incidences where this has occurred and the other incident that brought up straight away i think news outlets even compared the same was um when brandon lee was um shot and killed on the set of the crow and i mean you would have thought they would have learned by now but the fact that we're now in this situation once again and another life has been taken another creative has been taken far too soon and it's just simply awful awful tragedy and my thoughts go to the family um right now yeah is there any anything else anyone wants to add before we uh, go on no just you know whenever anything happens to filmmakers you always kind of they're always one of us and it could have been any of us and that's scary and upsetting and she was just breaking through and she was excited to be breaking through and that is so right the fruit to be excited because she's I don't know. I don't know her personally. I don't know about her. But what I hear is that she'd worked so hard, and she was finally getting the career that she'd served, and it's been taken from her. And the reason it was is because, you know, they didn't want actors to to have fake reactions to guns. They wanted realism, and because of that, she's gone. The director is also. We should point out the director is also very injured and in hospital. That's two two people really. You know, losing any any crew member is is awful and it shouldn't have happened for the sake of realism there's no excuse not to use cgi cgi muscle flash for example anymore but you know there's not enough women dops out there and now there's one less and it just makes it even worse but yeah it, it's it's very sad and hopefully if nothing's good can really come of it but hopefully this will prompt the yeah no more no more real guns on set this has to be the last time it shouldn't have happened once with brandon lee let alone twice yeah, exactly. It's uh, and it's one of those things, isn't it? It's like many industries in which people don't realize, you know, when they go to see films, you know, it, it's people like stunt people, etc. It's one of those art forms and industries like people lose their lives to bring this stuff to us sometimes, and you know, it's it's tragic and and crazy to think of that. The same way that you receive anything or any like product or industry, you know, people die for it sometimes which you know is, is mad especially when it is something like stunts because they know the risk they're taking but in circumstances like this obviously like i said she she wasn't to know that something tragic like that would happen um so we often go to like clips which are relevant to the topics we're talking about in this podcast so i felt uh, it was appropriate here to uh, just play the trailer uh, from uh, the w film that she uh, won um, a cinematography award Four, which is the short film Treacle. God, you look like shit. Thank you. Mwah. Had a great time last night. Is this boy Jamie or girl Jamie? This is boy Jamie. I thought you were seeing girl Jamie this week. Oh, morning. I did. I saw her Thursday. Wow. Why do I get the feeling you're about to turn this all around on me? So, a relevant trailer to play there as short films are often the starting point for many filmmakers, but also the core of the industry in regards to getting projects off the ground. 
So with that in mind, as well as the grief filmmakers can get in our digital age, we wanted to talk all about the work difficulties, but also gambles that are involved in making a film, especially when comic book movies are so prevalent. When you look at the likes of Joker, Into the Spider-Verse, or Captain America, The Winter Soldier, these are all projects with clear visions and an element of risk that paid off when everything came together. Joker, for example, takes a very famous and popular character, but if given a generic or unoriginal script, could have failed from the offset. Uh, But for it to become such a big success, it meant having the radically frightening and tragic performance of Joaquin Phoenix, it meant having the powerful and haunting score from Hilda Gertenutter, the visceral direction of Todd Phillips, the stunningly contrasting cinematography from Lawrence Hsu, the crucial art direction of Laura Ballinger Gardner, and the effective editing of Jeff Groth. This is just to name a few members and elements that make the film work so much. So, other projects, however, for all their efforts and talents, don't always come together, perhaps as intended. Recent examples that I thought of were Wonder Woman 1984, New Mutants, Mortal Kombat, and maybe even Black Widow. None of these are bad films per se, but they didn't have that special source the previous films mentioned did. Not every film can be a total win. Some losses are at the hands of studios, something like Dark Phoenix, while others just haven't had the gamble fully pay off, maybe whether it be financial box office success or you know fan acclaim, uh, something possibly like DC's Shazam. So... Let's discuss why that can be the case, why making a film is a tough job, an art form which can see magical moments come together on set, or maybe just fate might be against you when you're doing that certain project. So uh, I wanted to start, you know, we've talked about your favorite films, but your guys sort of how you became started with uh, filmmaking, just to get an idea of your history, etc. with it and how that's been important to the projects you've, you've made. So... Uh, Sophie, what what was your sort of journey? How did you uh, come to become a, a director and a filmmaker? I mean, if we're going way back, my introduction to I mean, I'm a huge fantasy fan. That's probably <laughs> probably obvious already, but I became obsessed with the genre from a very young age because my dad uh, he had just Boris Fellagio artworks all around the house, all the classic eighties fantasy, and he showed us books of, of fantasy artworks and showed us all the 80s fantasy films like Dragon Slayer and Willow and I just yeah I loved all of that stuff so obviously that's why we went to see Lord of the Rings as a family because it was a continuation of that and that's what as I said sparked my journey as a filmmaker I actually started my career in the art department and the costume department of of the film industry so making sets and props and making costumes Um, and although I don't do that anymore I'm still just obsessed with the creative side of of the film industry and art department is a huge influence on me I know a lot of people are cameraman's directors I'm I'm very much an art department person's director and also an actor director but yeah and yeah since then I eventually finally started directing my own films I founded a production company as you said Triscale Pictures since then I've produced I've directed eight shorts and I've produced four one of which was lucky enough to be long-listed for best British short at the BAFTAs in 2015 I think it was now and yeah all the films that I or we as a team have made have had that kind of magical realism edge so even when it's a drama film it's very visual. It's all about showing thought and expressing emotions through the film's visuals. So we've dabbled in fantasy, we've dabbled in drama, but I tried to have a consistent sense of magic and wonder and art and creativity amongst all of them as well. Uh, Rob, how about yourself? What what was your sort of journey? How did you come into it? Um, so I I came into film pure and simply from just my first exposure to cinema. Uh, if I'm completely honest with you, like as soon as I saw Toy Story at the age of five, I knew I wanted to be Buzz Lightyear, not realizing what I actually meant was I want to be a storyteller. And um, from 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 there, I basically trained to be a cartoonist. I wanted to go into animation originally, and uh, I trained with a known cartoonist named Hugh J. Davis, um, who ended up doing a new modern kind of take on um, um, like a Captain Britain character from the 50s and reinvented it for the the early noughties. And um, from there, 
Um, I then went into art and design and discovered photography and I love darkroom photography. I still am a you know huge fan of old school ways of um, photography and, and actually cutting film. And that's when I discovered Super 8 um, filming and I shot my first short film, which was a stop motion uh, clay um, plastic animation film on Super 8. So I actually used to, you know, click, you know, shoot it the old fashioned way and, you know, cut it and splice it, sellotape it and, you know, getting the nitty gritty, you know, craftsmanship when it goes into making a film. And um, I just absolutely loved that um, straight away. And I soon realized that, well, first of all, that animation is an incredibly long process and consuming time to, to, to create a film. But I wanted to make the jump to live action and understand um, why I still get these incredible um, feelings when I watch certain movies. And I've said numerous times watching The Dark Knight at 17 changed my life when I saw that someone had taken the character I'd love for so long and actually made it into something so believable to the point where it's, you know, it could actually happen with our own society. So that's where I suddenly realised, well, actually, if maybe I could make that jump to live action as well. And then to jump further ahead, went to university, studied film, film theory and then I went to film school at Ealing Studios at the Met Film School where I then um, got my master's in film directing and um, similar to Sophie um, I made a um, short film which was then long listed for the um, BAFTA um, that year as well and um, yeah from uh, from there it was I was doing a lot of storyboarding and concept art for other um, filmmakers um, films and um it was at that moment I realized that actually I, I, I really liked the understanding of um, and learning from other directors about how they communicate their ideas and how much it is very much a visual medium and not so much a, you know, like just um, get a few things together and just, you know, shoot it and then edit in that way afterwards. It's, you know, there is actually a craftsmanship to it. And um, um, from there, I just realized that I wanted to get into screenwriting and uh, directing. So that's why I made the jump to film school. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, that process is such an important part as well, isn't it? When you talk about that kind of film theory, understanding all of that kind of stuff, like, but then there's also the community. So there's those who might have like started just from purely through work or like doing independent stuff on the side of other work. So they might have like not gone down like the academic park uh, path. And I think of all of that kind of works in tandem because it just depends on the way that you approach it often people will say you know well how are you going to get a job at the end of that and it, it's not that kind of you know avenue you're not taking filmmaking or animation or anything at the university to get a specific job at the end of it it's not like maths or business or anything in which they go yeah you know like or engineering is quite a good one in which they're like yeah you take an apprenticeship and like they will literally give you a job at the end of it whereas this is kind of like to learn more about it to like gain the experience to get more understanding about where you want to go and there's so many people who like have that journey and say yeah i really like this aspect i like that element um and the theory stuff is is just so important to, to giving you that experience uh you know sophie how important do you think that you know, bringing forward your vision and those elements that we've talked about, you know, cinematography, lighting, direction, in the projects you've done, how how important was that for you in bringing all of that forward? Actually, picking up on something you said earlier, you were saying about having the fear of not having the technical knowledge to make the kind of films you want to make. And for me, that's where your team comes in because... I mean, while it's good as a director to learn as much as you can and experience as much as you can, and I always say to everyone, don't be a director until you've become a member of crew because you've got to know not just what your DOP is doing, but you've got to know what your runners are doing because they're less connected, they're going to get tired, you've got to know how they're feeling. So while it is good for a director to know as much as they can, and there are some filmmakers out there who are geniuses like Guillermo del Toro who kind of knows everything, but at the same time, One of the biggest, most important things you can do as a director is to acknowledge what you don't know and what your cracks are and to fill those with your crew. Your job is not to be the best person at everything. Your job is to get people who are the best at what they do and bring them together and to get them to do great work and encourage them to do great work under one vision. 
So, you know, you're, you're probably not going to be the best person at anything in that room. Your actors are the best at acting. Your DOP is the best at camera. Your production designer is the best at production design. And as an ex-production designer, it's hard for me to admit that, but Charlotte is better than me. And, <laughs> and she's amazing. And yeah, that, that is the biggest thing. It's, it's about bringing together people who can make your film better. I mean, I started out as a one-man band filmmaker, shooting and editing everything myself and just filming my mates and stuff. My, my first film was a Lord of the Rings mick take, um, which was awful, and all the costumes were made out of cardboard and curtains, and it was horrendous, and the sound was recorded into the camera, you know, and going from back then to now, the films have only got better because my crews have got better, have got bigger, sorry. Like, the more people I have working on a film, the more voices there are, the more talents there are, and like I said, the director's job is to, to bring out the best in all those people which is daunting but it's a it's a blessing and yeah the more people you work with and the more they grow with you and the more you work with filmmakers that are more experienced than you the better your film's going to be so that is it is just the most important thing is you know yeah acknowledging what you don't know and listening to the people that do know and letting them shine it's never a director's film it's it's them doing their best work you know under that one vision so it's an honor really yeah, I would actually totally agree with you on that, uh, Sophie. Although someone who would disagree with you is a director like David Fincher, who <laughs> has, you know, he's come out and said that he needs to learn every aspect of filmmaking. So then when he gets on set, he can tell everybody what to do exactly to his vision. But I can, I tried to do that myself. And like, you know, I had that because I, yeah, filmmakers like David Fincher, you know, who are amazing. And they say, learn everything you can. No one's going to be an expert at everything, and I have cocked that up myself. I remember one time I was preparing for the fantasy film Songbird that my team and I made, and we were in the makeup trials getting the witch ready. And I was watching my makeup artist, Charlotte Price, getting the witch ready, and I was saying to her, yeah, try a bit more powder, try a bit more, yeah, a bit more powder. And she, at one point she just put her makeup brushes down, turned to me and said, Sophie, that's not how powder works. And I was like, you are the expert on makeup, I don't know. And it was that moment of realisation of like, I need to stop pretending that I am the authoritative voice on everything, because I did for a while. Every filmmaker I think they think has to. And <laughs> there are so many filmmakers that yeah, probably think they know the best thing to do, they know the best lens to use and whatever. They might not. They've got to listen to the voices and the ideas of their team because, you know, they probably don't have the best idea. And, you know... David Finch is amazing, but surely, surely he listens to his DOP and he listens to the ideas of his DOP. Yeah, I think I think the core of that is just like you said earlier, it's about that team dynamic, isn't it? Because then people who work on a David Fincher film might be like, right, we know what to expect on this. He's in charge. We, you know, some of them might enjoy that element of it. Some people might like a more collaborative set. Some people might like being told directly what to do it's the same as in many work environments I suppose it's like what do you like doing and I think that's again the mistake that some people find with studios and especially because comic book movies are like some of our biggest films at the moment it's like well maybe those people just didn't get along or maybe they had this vision and this other person came in and was like well this is what I want to do and or you know they maybe weren't fussed about doing that project or whatever there can be all sorts of different reasons and I suppose that's why a lot of the times that kind of independent film short film can work a lot better because you are working with the people that you want and when studios are able to give that power to filmmakers and that's why I felt that like Joker was quite a good example is because it very much felt like everything was working together like you said before that there's that understanding from everyone of how important those elements are um but you know allowing them to sort of breathe and and work on their own but you know you, you in a way it's sometimes if the composer wasn't available that year and you know somebody else did it would that have then has been a successful film it's you know some an element of luck to it as well like you know rob have, have you found that as well in terms of how important it is with getting your vision is about how important all of those cogs are working together oh yeah no absolutely i mean i i haven't got really much to say apart from that i just echo everything sophie's just said really i mean pretty much was very cohesive and very tightly put i have to say um uh, the only thing that i can honestly add to that is um 
um, the interpretation of what the envision is of because you you hit the nail on the head again when you said about um, you know um, the director is not solely on that one vision. You know, there may be they may be the helm of the ship. That's the most common, or the the conductor, the orchestra. You know, there's the that old phrase of they're the conductor and everything else. And the fact of the matter is, these are multiple voices, or what I commonly now say is there's multiple truths coming in together to form an overall truth for the the film that's being presented because that's what we're ultimately um bringing to the screen at the end of the day is multiple voices that convenate to this point of this truth that we're now seeing on the screen and um for me that's even brought out even further when it comes to working with actors as well that you know, they are the ones that are going to be the most vulnerable out there. And they're the ones that are bringing your, you know, you're not saying to them, you know, like, you know, some people do, they do force, you know, a piece of direction on them where they are forced to, um, you know, say the line in a certain way. And, uh, you, you know, we mentioned David Fitch is very particular on the way he wants his um, things, to, um, vision to be seen on the screen. I watched earlier, um, how the movies made us and aliens was one of them. And it was um, James Cameron um, and how he's very particular on how lines are certain uh, are said. And if you change the way some, some lines are said in a script, he will get furious because if he's written it in a certain way, he's, you know, clearly got an interpretation of what he wants that to be. So he will do a line reading of it, which for me is not, um, really a good way to approach working with an actor um or even crew members i should say because um as sophie said you know like with her example of the makeup artist um the only time i think i've ever had like a clash with a crew member because again all-round filmmaker myself where i've done camera operating or editing where um I took the mouse off an editor, but like just naturally by accident, by accident, again, by accident, by ac- it was a pure like accident thing. And I Oof. rectified my mistake very quickly by, you know, just saying, Oh, I'm so sorry. And she's, and she was very kind about it. She was like, no, no, that's fine. But if you do it again, I'll kill you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was one of those moments where, you know, when you're trying to communicate an idea and it wasn't coming across as, you know, you wanted it clear enough. So in hindsight, I should have just said, uh, let me explain it this way rather than take the mouse or whatever. And again, it was one very small mistake, but you know, that's why you have your team there is that, you know, you trust them. And in that one small moment, I, you know, I, I slipped up and we all do, you know, we you all have to be that so happen. patient. Don't you Rob? You need to be so patient and explain it to them and yeah, help them come to those conclusions. Definitely a patience test. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it can be, it can be, it can be, but you know, like um, I've, worked with multiple ed- editors since and you know again never touch the equipment uh, and it's the same with camera operators as well d- d- you know don't never say to a camera operator oh I, c- I can i can get that for you you know or even be like a you know the stunt person like oh i can do that stunt for you that one <laughs> uh, no you can't though can you uh so uh why don't you just say uh, yeah that should be a metaphor for just this, like you know it's just like just don't take the mouse on this one don't worry i'm not going to take the mouse yeah, that's the new like <laughs> phrase that you say to like vocalize that you're not gonna not gonna take control too much <laughs> mm, absolutely oh i forgot the dog name don't speak you're pretty sure you don't smile either hey come on sit down uh, i gotta go but I won't be long. I lock the door. Don't open it to anybody, understand? Good. Oh, snap. I just saw the bat signal. You better go. I'm glad you guys brought in, you know, the element of, like, performances and how important that is because... There's obviously, again, stories you hear of those actors who will do the take the exact same every time. And then again, that might clash with, act, you know, directors who might want it certain ways. Um, there's those actors who might vary it up every take. There's that whole classic thing of like, you know, knowing your mark and that makes a big difference. Um, you know, Rob, how, how have you found how important that sort of collaboration of actors and performances are? And 
and how can that have an impact again on some of these big or or even short film you know smaller scale films of how crucial that is because again if the performance you know you can have like the best looking most amazing film in the world but then if the performances don't quite land then it that is like you know the front and center of, of the movie I mean, for me, uh, we're all brave in our own way as crew members, as directors. Um, but I think actors are the most vulnerable people on set because they're the ones that have got the cameras in front of them. And they're the ones that we have to believe the most. I mean, every piece of production design, of course, and, and cinematography and the lighting. But at the end of the day, all eyes are on the actors. And I, I used to act myself. Uh, not very well, I might add, but I used to act nonetheless. Uh, um, I do have a kind of a sad st- a tale, which, you know, has kind of motivated me to be the person I am today. But um, when I was 17, um, uh, 17 or 18, I had a careers advisor um, come in and they also were a casting director. And um, they said to me, um, oh, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I want to work in the film industry. And I said, oh, what would you what would your ideal roles be? And I said, director, director. Um, writer and an actor and they said what would you what do you see yourself right now i said i'd like to act and they said all right tell me your because again casting director in front of you um what's your dream role and i said i would love to be james bond and the the casting director said two things they said one you're far too overweight and i was like okay no no i can take that you know look you know i can slim down whatever and then the other thing they said was the only way that they're going to make you james bond is if they change the character's name to Muhammad Bond. And I will never, ever forget that because that at that moment, I kind of realized to myself that, and it's a sad way of putting it this way, but I said to myself at the moment, I don't think I'm going to be an actor. At that moment, I was like, I don't think I'm going to be an actor, but the one thing I am going to be is a creative that's going to help those people who have been rejected like that and never have that happen to them again. And that's why I say that actors are the most vulnerable people on set because they're the ones that are bringing the truth and the emotion to the screen and all eyes are on them. So to have someone who had just their eyes on me at that moment to take those two suggestions of you're not going to be James Bond because one, you're overweight and you're clearly too brown to be Bond. Um, So yeah, it was it was a tough um, thing to deal with. And that's why it's such a, an important thing to create a safe environment for an actor to be in, to have the freedom to play as well. Because at the end of the day, that's what they're there to do. They're there to bring um, um, to life the characters that you've uh, that you've imagined. And you have to be willing to let go of some of the things that you had in your own mind, which I think is why directors like Alfred Hitchcock would not work in today's industry uh, well at all. Uh, do you know what? I would have loved to have seen him try and work with like Marlon Brando or Dustin Hoffman. Like he would not be able to control them at all. Like they would go off and do their own thing, you know? Um, but whereas, you know, Hitchcock was very much a, Oh, they're like actors are like cattle. You know, you just put them in places and you let them hit their marks and stuff. I and mean, you would not be able to get away with direction like that now. And that's why result direction is like the worst piece of direction you can give to any actor or even line reading, as I mentioned before with James Cameron. Um, for me, it's about guiding the the actors into a safe space where they have the freedom to play and actually uh, feel comfortable to go to places that they want to go down while also making sure that they're both in a physical, uh, in a physically safe space, but also in a mental safe space as well, because, you know, of course there's, um, many acting methods that they can take on, whether it's a Brechtian um, approach or um, method Stanislavskian approach. And um, I think over the last couple of years in particular, um, I've, I've seen myself as an actor director now because um, I just, I, my role ultimately as a director is to make sure that they are um, in that safe space, but they're also giving the truth that I want to be seen on screen and everyone else needs to see on screen as well for the audience to believe in what they're seeing and that story just reminds me as well of like you know there's a lot of examples of this bossy dc fandoms just happened so you know jake we were discussing it on the episode the other day there was the actor who is playing blue beetle which was talking so much about like how important this was and what it means to kids who can watch him and go like oh that could be me and even the same i suppose with the directors etc as well 
Uh, Sophie, what what other elements do you think Saw can make or break a film in, you know, how important it is to keep control about something like that or even something that sometimes can, you know, can be out of your control? With the acting side? Um, uh, just any element, I guess, if the, you know, whether it be acting or any I other mean, Yeah, I'd elements. love to talk, to expand on the acting a little bit more. I mean, I think why that matters, so obviously we're on, you know, this podcast in particular, your audience are interested in in the fantasy genre and superhero films. So let, let's focus on that for a moment. Fantasy and superheroes and sci-fi does not work if you've got all this crazy, beautiful, magical things going on and you feel lost. And that is why your actors are so important. This is why, yeah, Tolkien, Lord of the Rings worked. This is why WandaVision worked so well, because you have these high concept magical characters with powers and chaos magic and everything and it was a drama about relationship and grief and family life and the simple pleasures of watching tv as a family and that's why it connected with people and it's because it's your characters and you have to have that in the middle of all the madness to anchor it and that's why your actors are super super important and getting the best out of them i mean i love Every script I always say isn't finished until you've had an actor read it. And you were talking about line reading is my least favorite thing. I call it parroting because you are essentially turning your actor into a parrot rather than a performer. And it's not genuine. They're not feeling it. They have to say a line in a way that sounds like they would say it. And so we never complete a script until we've had a line read with the actors. Well, we have had them perform it. Jane Campion is phenomenal at this because she will make the actors perform the script as written and then she goes, right, perform that scene as you. How would you react in that moment? And she gets the actors to do that. And after that, she then takes what she's heard and puts it back into the script so it sounds genuine, it sounds like their words. And you see that in films like Bright Star just beautifully. And so we always do that. That's how you find out which actors... like. On, on the big scale, it, it shows you how to get a genuine performance across and, and how to relate to these characters. On a smaller level, it, it shows you which actors can't swear comfortably. <laughs> and no, You hear it all the time. You see actors saying these really gritty, sweary lines. I'm thinking, you wouldn't say that, would you? That doesn't <laughs> sound genuine. And you change it and you, you make them more sweary or less sweary. And I love the dynamic of when you get I know I talk about working with experienced filmmakers and my, my usual filmmakers. I, I love our language, but I love working with new actors. I love the dynamic of when you get a really experienced actor and a brand new actor and you put them together and you, the way they bounce off each other and what they learn from each other is phenomenal. I've, I've done that a few times. Um, and knowing that each actor needs different things in order to perform. It's not just this is how you work with an actor. That's it. Some need so much rehearsal to feel comfortable and confident others are like just wind me up and let me go and that is just one of the most exciting things as the director is is learning what kind of an actor your actor is what they need from you what they don't need from you and every time you work with a new actor you you learn what kind of actor that person is and, and how to get the best performance from them and that's so exciting but yeah it, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach but I, that is why it's so important it's yeah it, it, it's someone the audience can see themselves in and that's why your whole film will fail if your actors if your audience sorry is just watching a film and they're lost and they're not feeling yeah it, that's why it, it's so important can I just quickly ask do you like to Im- rehearse with your actors and do improvisations with them as well because um I I I again you hit the nail on the head when you said it depends on the actor that you're working with and what they you know what their experiences is, is as well and uh, how they work so I just wanted to quickly ask are you someone that loves to rehearse with your actors or and improv as well so I love rehearsal absolutely love it and I will try and push for it but again there's some actors that say can we can we stop rehearsing now because I want to go in fresh yeah and listening to that and again I, I have there's shoots in the past particularly early on where I've tried to push improv and some actors are like, yes, let's do that. And I was like, I really like knowing the words inside out. I feel comfortable in that. I perform best when I'm 
particularly TV actors in particular, those who work on, on soap, soap actors are incredible. They will deliver the, a performance exactly the same every time. Even the way they place their teacup down is identical every time. They're an editor's dream. Whereas newer actors, you're kind of like, oh, that looks completely different all over the place. Um, but that's exciting. And that's what's so fresh about it. And so you can't improv with every actor. Some actors don't improv and that's not who they are. And you don't get a natural performance from them. So yeah, I absolutely love it. But there's some that that's the difficult thing is knowing which actors work best when you stop rehearsing, but then noticing when there's an actor in the room who needs more rehearsal and doesn't feel comfortable speaking up because their colleagues done rehearsing and they're ready and listening and knowing, yeah, that one needs more rehearsal. And that's so important. And, you know, and you will see it on the day if one hasn't had enough rehearsal or if one's had too much, you see it on the day. So it's, Oh, you have to kind of know in advance how you're going to fail <laughs> a little bit and plan for it. And, it's, and you don't always get it right. But it's so important to listen. To that. So, yeah, rehearsal is so important and knowing how your actors respond and what they need at that point. Um, have you guys, I was going to ask as well. So just on that note of like the way the like lines were read, uh, Sophie, I, this was one that stood out to me was in uh, Growing Shadows. Was there that element? The one that stood out to me because I just loved the way it was performed is when uh, Ashlyn performed that line of like bingo. Was that like a moment which was kind of like when she's talking to the Bruce across the bars? I was like, oh, I like the way she did that because again, from a writer's perspective, you can understand that you'd be writing a line like that going like, I have to have a lot of faith in the performer that they'll pull this off because they could kind of do it very cheesy or something like that. So the fact, I guess it helps that she sort of did the screenplay in that scenario. But um, was that like, was there lines like that that you had on, on set, which was kind of like, this could have gone very badly, but thank God that they, you know, they did it this way or you, you sort of had to point it in that direction. I mean, yeah, I, it's, it'd be so easy to throw it away and say, well, she wrote it and you know, well, she did. She did write it. So she, obviously she knew, was imagining how she was going to say her lines, I assume, while she was writing it some months, almost like a year in advance. So... Yeah, she kind of, she knows herself as a performer so well, so she can write for herself really well. A lot of actors these days, I've noticed, are making films for themselves. I know actor producers, actor writers who are kind of creating parts that they know they can do well because they're not getting good enough parts, some of them, from other people. So I, I see that a lot. But generally, Ashlyn is one of those people where you can just wind her up and watch her go. And also she, she has loved Poison Ivy, as I have, since she was a kid she was born for the role she was she knew exactly like for years she was itching to play the part and no one's made like a poison ivy film so she hasn't been able to audition so we're like let's just make one ourselves i'm sick of waiting and so she was so eager to go and so that was ashlyn's what well, yeah you just you like go do that you can do it she knows what she's doing you don't have to tell her how to be poison ivy but equally at the same time it was you know as with all the films, there were there were there were rehearsal sessions where we did try some improvisation, not on set with that one. We had a very short window of time on location, so that's why we needed to be prepared. But even beforehand, there would be times when we'd go, right, we know these characters, we know Bruce and Ivy super well. We're clearly all obsessed with Batman. Let's strip back and think about the scenario and think about how can you guys relate as people. Um, how would you relate if you saw the other in prison or you know what's it like for Bruce coming in and putting himself in the scenario where he's essentially going to be intoxicated and he knows he's, he's going to be intoxicated and he knows it's going to make him weak and this is a man who lives on being strong what's that going to be like for the character and so we researched drug addicts and going back to addiction and intoxication and putting yourself in that scenario or trying to recover from it and kind of how much that would wrench a person so yeah it was a, a lot of it was just they knew what they were doing so well but also there was taking time out and, and finding realization behind every line rewriting lines so it, it would flow naturally from both actors was, was was super important with that one so yeah a lot of it was just that's just Ashlyn she can do she can do Ivy but it was also that is Ashlyn in Ivy and finding that balance yeah and, and that you know the importance of direction as well as you said compared to writing like there's times in which I've seen stuff again I guess I mentioned it as an example earlier was like Dark Phoenix where Simon Kimberg who's got a great career as a writer but when I was watching that film I was like you can f feel here where he's got that lack of experience as a director which we were saying earlier about how important it is to sort of like try all the different avenues because you've got great performers like 
James McAvoy, Michael Fassbender, etc. And you're like, why is this not working? Why is, you know, why is this not coming across as it should? Or why is it coming across not great? And maybe, you know, it, it, it's it's down to, to the direction there. So I suppose that's a example of maybe where it's not quite working about maybe where he he hasn't maybe sort of taken somebody aside and gone, uh, maybe try it this way or given them, you know, too much free reign or maybe just there wasn't any direction at all, which is obviously quite often cited at uh, George Lucas when it comes to people like Terrence Stamp, etc. And they're just like, yeah, I just turned up and, you know, like uh, they were just interested in the visuals because he's very much like a thespian kind of actor that didn't gel at all with like the kind of filmmaking he was involved with. But I just think on the other side, somebody like Ian McDermott, which is like, well, George is not going to be in any direction, so I'll just go mental and do what I want, which is great. So um, People can be miscast, and casting directors are so important. Like, it, Yes, it can be the direction, it can be the script, it can be whatever happened on that day. That Disconnect is the main thing. There is disconnect for some reason. Sometimes it is the directors. and But it is really important to cast the right person as, as well. Often you know, great actors can, can fake it or whatever, but... If they don't find themselves, if they're not enabled to find themselves in a role, you know, it's it, yeah, it's so hard to tell where stuff's gone wrong when there's disconnect. But sometimes it is casting. Sometimes it isn't the right person for the role, and some or sometimes they've not been allowed to shine. So it's hard to tell sometimes. Yeah, again, to Dark Phoenix, I just think you know I love Jennifer Lawrence. She's great, and I think she does a great job in some of the other films. But you could tell in that film that she was like, I don't want to be here, and it literally like in the film they're like, yeah, and this is you know acts this character to like help her like leave because she clearly doesn't want to do this uh rob is there any sort of examples you can think of like with crime alley in which like you know that relationship was vital in terms of like actor director or even with you know other roles um well with them with crime alley i th- there are three central performances uh within it and with vincent as the father um i can give like one of one example in which um um we were in a situation where i realized that we needed to get bella um away from the from the table and at, at that moment um i just said to cuz I, I so one of the things i i do with my actors is i call them by their characters names so um vincent's character is actually called um uh michael so we kept calling him mike uh, on the day so i just say mike can you do this mike this that blah 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 yeah uh, and with the case with um, Bella, I would just call her, um, I think her name was Jess. So we just called her Jess throughout the day so that she got to really play around with that. And then with Batman, I just simply called him Batman. So everyone kept calling him Batman this, Batman that, you know, oh, Batman, can you lift your cape up a little bit? Batman, you're blocking the light a little bit. Batman, can you, um, you know, w- we'll grab you for the next couple of minutes, Batman. You know, Batman was said a lot during that day. And it's been far too said too many times right now in that sentence alone. So there we go. But for the, for the actors, it's just so that they're, they're aware that they're being in that role still. So I'm not calling them by their real name. And with Vincent, there was a moment where we had to get um, Jess away from the table. And I just said, um, what would be really great is if, um, um, you know, try and get her away from the table. And he said, how do you want me to do that? And I said, um, and I basically said, well, why don't we try a line? You know, um, th- um, th- think of something in the moment. And um that's when he says the whole, oh, snap, I just saw the bat signal. You better go. So that was literally an improv line from Vincent's part. Um, and that was the take we used. So that was a great moment of us with just, you know, playing around just for a couple of minutes just to um, for him to just think, what what would he say for her to get away from the table so he can't show his weakness in that moment? Because um, it then correlates with the ending where he does eventually show that he's uh, a broken down father, and trying to you know save his daughter um in that moment and then and with bella working with ch- children you know <laughs> i think sophie might be uh, agree to this or not i'm not sure but th- th- there is that phrase of you don't work with animals or you don't with ch- don't work with children because basically they're not acting they're just roaming around everywhere they do whatever they want you know basically but with bella um it's an infectious energy that you want from a child actor that they you bring them into the set and you create an environment for them where they can actually embrace everything that they're seeing right there and then. And they've got an amazing ability to just, just listen to what's being said. Cause you know, I, I taught Bella as well at, uh, at the Academy I used to teach at, And so I used to say to her, you know, acting is reacting. And I would say acting is, and she would respond reacting. So it was a kind of way of um, getting that direction across to her and um, just making sure that each time that, you know, Vincent would say a line, 
um, she would be really listening into what he's saying. Because at the end of the day, um, acting is very much all about listening. I think even Morgan Freeman says that himself. And then with Batman, in the finale of the film in particular, one of the best pieces of direction um, you can give an actor is an image um, or a little piece of a backstory to um, something that's being um, happening within the moment. So in the finale of Crime Alley, spoilers for those who haven't seen the film, um, Bella is pointing um, a gun at Batman to save her father from being attacked by Batman even further. And we did two takes of the single on um, Batman. Um, and on the second take, I, I turned around to him and I said, Bruce. And he turned and gave me this, you know, very stern look of what the hell did you just call me? And I, I, I had to say, that's the same make of gun that killed your parents two floors d- below. And for him to process that in and to be like, okay, this means even more now than just a, an, just a random gun. This is the same make of a gun. And I'm looking at someone who's dressed in a Batman costume that I'm supposed to be bringing hope um, to a, to an otherwise hopeless city. And yet, what I'm doing right now and what I've been doing in my mission is not good enough. And to have a child point a weapon at me, it's not, you know, there's an, and it was a lot for him to process. And that's why he nailed it on the second take. And again, I come back to the point I mentioned earlier about vulnerability. When you see the actor in that moment, give it all. You've got to make sure that everyone else, the crew members are on point because if a camera operator or even a sound operator turns around and says, oh, it wasn't recording. And trust me, I have been on occasions where that has happened. And I have literally, I haven't lost my temper, but I would see the crushing blow that an actor feels within that moment because they know that they've given it their all. And yet if it hasn't been captured uh, in either sound or visuals, then we've wasted their time and we've we've actually harmed them in some way by doing that and like i said a, a fragile piece of direction like that can really lift a performance um there so that's why it's uh, that's why i say now that actors are very vulnerable and um i think in some ways that's why there has to be a very special relationship between the d- uh, director and the actor and to bounce off what sophie said before about you know getting to know what the actor how the actor works, but you are working with these people and you've got to have an understanding of who they are as a person outside of the characters in which they're playing, because trust me, they're going to bring much more than just the character. They're bringing themselves into these films and these stories, which is why they're so fragile. If I wanted to kill, I have far more potent friends than these. Poison... It's just a plant's defense mechanism. It's a way of reacting to pain. Sounds like someone's using my creation to make a statement. Perhaps someone who thinks it will impress me. That'd be Dr. Wood? Bingo. Why? Ivy, people are suffering. They're in comas, they're dying, and you think this is a joke? Well, you know better than most how my pheromones work. Can't always control them. Someone like Dr. Wood, who lingers intentionally a little too often. That's hardly going to help. With all of this in mind, then, um, and, you know, how people's reactions, and as I said, why a part of the reason we were talking about this and Sophie, as, as you were saying earlier, as like a big fantasy fan, etc. And we were talking about the different hats. Does you know is that something that happens with you? Do you kind of have that like experience of watching it as like, well, as somebody who makes films, I can understand my why what might have happened to you. Um, obviously, there's the respect aspect of like something great, but do you also get it on the other side? You know, do do you kind of sometimes are you more forgiving of something because you can understand how why maybe that what might not have worked or how difficult uh it was or or do you tend to sort of change your hat and just go no i'm in like you know viewer mode now 
Oh, I, I wish I was on viewer mode. Uh, <laughs> particularly when you're in the middle of a production, like when it's a really stressful production and you want to watch something in the evening. Like, I, I, I like I want to watch the least filmmaker thing possible. That happened once on Songbird. I got in in between shoots, had a little bit of time to relax. So I was like, let's watch Take Me Out. <laughs> <laughs> And I've not watched it since. And I, but I just needed something where I did wasn't analysing the shots because you know, it's bad enough the rest of the time. When you're in the middle of filmmaking mode, your filmmaker senses are like are tingling like spider senses. They're, they're really heightened, and so you you need to watch crap in order to, in order to shut it off. I I genuinely think that film school has ruined the cinema experience for me. I still love going to films, but I know how it felt as a kid seeing Lord of the Rings versus ha- films I've seen since then. I'm like, oh, that's the mise-en-scene. That's why they've used red. And it's just, it's a little bit shit seeing films as a filmmaker, if I'm honest. But at the same time, you do appreciate it. I mean, I still really enjoy stuff like Dune. Even seeing Dune with a the filmmaker there, it's so big and epic. After a while, you stop looking at the details and you look at the spectacle and you do enjoy it as a film, as a as a film fan again because it's so hard to relate to it and it's so hard to pick apart the, the the filmmaking that you can just get lost in it and that's amazing but I also now have a, such an appreciation for small indie films particularly as someone who's dying to make their first feature you see what they've done and you and you think oh that's quite achievable well done to them that's like, like they had a very small budget and they made something great and on those filmmaking experience you really do see the nuts and bolts but you you appreciate it more because you kind of put yourself in their shoes but also I think audiences sometimes forget that if films in the cinema should be enjoyable I think they're unfortunately and I'm guilty of this too there is this idea of there's certain films you're not allowed to like (laughs) like people were absolutely torn apart for, for liking the Twilight Saga and at the same time it's like well so what that was bums on seats in cinemas and people having a great time. And, you know, my partner and I, Edward, we were talking about this because he really enjoyed the first Venom film and he really wants to go see the new one. And he's like, I know it's not going to be very good. And there's all these reviews saying it's really bad. He's like, can I just go and enjoy my film, please? I'm like, of course you can. Of course you can. You know, that's a perfect example of that. Just go and enjoy your film and enjoy the filmmaking, the film viewing experience and put money into cinemas, please, for God's sake. You know? <laughs> so, it's it's you the negative of Rotten Tomatoes, isn't it? It's become so reliant on that. Like, well, it's rotten. It's like, it's got this percentage. I'm like, yeah, but that's a percentage of who thought it was good, not how bad it is, which annoys me to no end that people don't understand that. If it's 17% rotten, like a lot of people think like, oh, it's 17% of a good film. It's like, no, 17% of people thought it was good. So you might be one of those 17% people like with, you know, Venom, etc. So you might enjoy it. Let's not scare people away from the cinema, for God's sake. I love film reviews. I love reading Empire in particular. Like, let, let's not scare audiences away. Let's just let them enjoy their films without tearing them apart, you know. Otherwise, the cinema industry is in a bad way as it is. Let, yeah, let's not put people off from going to see a film if they want to see it, you know. Yeah, Jake, Jake will know better than anyone. You don't want to get me started on Twitter reviews, so <laughs> we'll, we'll avoid that one. Uh, yeah, v- very important uh, point to bring up there as well. Uh, Rob, you've got a hat on. Do you do you change hats when you uh, when you uh, go between you know your filmmaker mode and your? Critic you have mode? no idea, Dave, how many hats he's changed. Uh, I have, <laughs> but is his hats. hats to like relay what he the mood he's in? Kind of like, is, does he have like a Robin hat for when he's like, I am now in viewer mode. <laughs> I'm like Homer Simpson. I'll have a conversation hat. Give me my conversation <laughs> hat immediately. <laughs> um, so, if, funny enough, um, there was a there was a student who came up to me at Comic Con this weekend who who was the, in the screening of Batman, and um, they were like, "Oh, I really liked how you did this, and it was this, and that. and then part of me, as they were explaining this, I was thinking, "Oh my god, I sounded just like this student back in the day. Like, my god, I sounded like you know, like such a dork." But at the same time, like. I loved it. It was really refreshing to have somebody talk about your film that way. But then I was thinking, oh, my God, is this why all my other relationships didn't work? Because this is how I bored them to death. Like just analyzing their favorite movies and saying, no, actually, that film is garbage because of it. You know, and I would be like that, though. That's the thing. And oh, dear. But yeah, there was uh, for in terms of like analyzing things like I used to do it quite 
often and you know be like very critical on certain things but I've got to a point now where I've actually you know behaved in that regard I think the thing that I'm more critical about now more than ever is um if I'm completely honest in terms of like character choices and like representation in particular as well like for me, that has been, been such a big key thing for me for the last several years in particular, where you're watching something and you go, has someone else like written a, a part, you know, has someone written something specifically for that actor or is it what they think somebody of that nature would say in that, you know, and we were talking about this over the weekend about um, how important representation is in, in comics, movies and TV shows and that, you know, um uh, white writers would write for black characters like say Luke Cage in the 1970s and um like Blade in ni- in 1998 and um that's something I'm quite critical about now when I'm watching a film or you know you, you brought up earlier Wonder Woman 84 where um for me the biggest problem with that film is that you've got mainly uh, male writers writing for a Wonder Woman film. Yes, you've got Patty Jenkins involved in the story aspect of it, but if it's being completely dominated by by males uh, within this, you know, it kind of detracts the, away from what the film needs to be. And it's the same, I think, maybe with Black Widow as well, which is why I had a problem with that as well. It's, I think we need to get to a point now, if we're telling certain stories in a certain way, that we should bring in the authentic voice to come in there. And that's why you have the success of Black Panther, for example, because you've got 99.9% of the cast and crew being black, Asian, ethnic minorities and their voices and their authentic voices are being heard on screen. So that I am very critical of, but um, if I know of the certain circumstances or if I am aware of what the film is trying to be, then I'm not as overly critical as I once was, you know, either bringing up the mise-en-scene and this, that and the other, but or just, yeah, I'm more, I, I think as I've, I think so to agree on this as well, as we've grown as filmmakers, I think we've been more understanding. Forgiving. At, yeah, forgiving. That's the right word. That is definitely the right word. More forgiving of certain things. In, yeah, I think, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Forgiving, I think is the best way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah, and how you can respect those different elements as well. I know I always, and it weirdly happened again, like it's something about the Phoenix character, which composers are like, yeah, we can really get into the nitty gritty, like why this is a great character and some great, mo- great moments. So Hans Zimmer managed to like, you know, do, you know, a lot of people came out of that and said, oh, that that's one of the only good things about this, you know, the film is the score. But I always thought that, especially with The Last Stand, I was like, you know, this like has some of my like favorite, like, Mu- you know film music moments just because the film might not be great but john powell really understood like the the power and the scale of the story that was meant to be told so i find it quite fascinating when composers are at least a- a- able to detach themselves from what actually has gone down and what was actually being filmed do you guys have any sort of examples of ones that come to your mind which again are like bad films and again not something which you're necessarily like okay i can well, not one that you maybe like because it's bad or anything like that, or you're like, oh, everyone hates this film, but I personally like it, but one that you can kind of, kind of like, you know, what Rob was saying there a bit about, I can see why it's like this, and I can forgive them for, like, why it just didn't turn out the way that they wanted to, so you wouldn't be like we were saying, those people who were like, this is bad because of this, and this is shit, that you have those bad films which you're like, I can understand why that didn't work out. I, mean, I personally hated the new Mul- the new Mulan adaptation. I just hated it. But at the same time, I I, I went as you know, sorry Twitter review. I went to, I went to say I hated this film. And as I was writing, I hated this film. I was like, oh, but the, the, the set designers did such a great job, and the props were beautiful, and you know the cinematography. To, I like- to be clear, I have no problem if you just went. I don't like this film. My problem is when people do in depth reviews on Twitter. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, no, otherwise, but- I would be guilty myself for being like, hey, I like this. <laughs> but for me, I just couldn't do it because I was like, there's some people who did a brilliant job on this film absolutely brilliant and just like i even did like instagram stories i did a separate story like just to say production design weather workshop outstanding well done guys you if you were making that film and you know you have achieved what you needed to achieve in this film 
kudos, you know. But again, that was a film about Chinese culture, not written by Chinese people. And it, it was just cocked up on so many levels. There's a, a fantastic video on YouTube. And I'm sorry, I can't remember who wrote it about everything culturally wrong with Mulan. And they nailed it. And just and all the things that felt off can be explained through that from just a lack of understanding of yeah and just the message in general was I thought it was kind of offensive for young women as well because the original Mulan had she was a normal woman with you know no powers who managed to prove herself in a world of men that's amazing and they they made this Mulan like Neo or like or like Captain Marvel and gave her superpowers how's that empowering or relatable for young women and in any way like uh anyway but that was one example where I I thought it was an awful film, but I thought someone did a fantastic job. And you know, it's it is about thinking about seeing the film as the whole picture. Again, Twilight very, very critically panned and mocked, but the prop team did a wicked job. I keep seeing the props, I'm like, they're bloody brilliant props. You know, there's people doing A star work out there. Suicide Squad, another one, a good example, massively hated, won an Oscar for best makeup probably rightly so the makeup team did a great job and I really like that particularly award season when you see not just one film being awarded everything because it's an amazing film when they actually think who was the which was the best edited film and they and they look at it like in in pieces and they look and look at it at different stages like the year when Baby Driver won best editing and Whiplash won another one won best editing and those films I don't think won anything else and that's fair. And that is saying, yes, this film had the best editing. It probably wasn't the best film of the year, but it had the best editing. And it's, yeah, it's about kind of recognising the sum of the parts rather than the whole, I think, when you come to criticising films. Rob, is there any uh, projects like that which come to mind, which again was like it was a bad film, not necessarily one that you liked, but you could again understand like, OK, I, I see what went wrong here. I can understand. I can sympathise with the directors or the creators. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I think I can probably, uh, without delving too much into this, because I think we've delved into this in the past, well, especially this year, but the one film that I am really astounded by, and I think it's one that will be written for many, many, many years in the critical theory, but, and Jake knows exactly what film I'm going to bring up, and it's, it's the Justice League, you know, it's, it's Justice League, you know, we all knew going into it, something was horrifically wrong, I mean, the family tragedy uh, of Zack Snyder's daughter is just heartbreaking even to this day. And his vision got completely stripped away from him. And yet we're watching, uh, we're paying to see something on the screen, which is completely compromised and it's been completely shaped to be something else entirely. And, it, you know, it, I it, I remember watching it and thinking it, this was like one of the most heartbreaking experiences of watching a film in the cinema because I was watching something that was completely manhandled into being something completely different. But the one saving grace in all of it, if I'm completely honest with you, was actually seeing Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman because I just thought, okay, so we've still got this character of hope and this beacon of hope, and she plays that role superbly. Even in both in both versions, he plays the role superbly, and yet now with with the Snyder Cut um, movement, and we now have the definitive version that we've been craving for for all this time. And I mean, you, you, you guys, we spoke about this for like four hours. <laughs> we, we we could instantly see the big differences between the two, you know, and it was to be celebrated to actually see a creative and an artist actually get what he rightly deserved which was to have his creative vision and his voice back but not just his voice but you know the dps the 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 composers you know he got to compose the film because he got that taken away from him when he was um originally on board so um it's not, I, I have to say by the way sophie i'm really glad you brought up the moonline example because um as I said before, like the reason why Black Panther works is because of the authentic voice. And Mulan is a, an incredible example where they just get it completely wrong. But yet there are certain aspects of it where, you know, people are still putting their craft into that work regardless. And it's the same with the um, Justice League, Justice League, whatever we want to call that piece of garbage now. Um, it's, you know, it's there are certain aspects to that where people are giving it their all. And yet 
as we now know, there have been some things that have been completely stripped away, like the disgracefulness that is, you know, stripping away the representation of um, Cyborg's character and um, all the other black actors in the film and the Asian characters in the film as well, being completely dismissed and put to one side or sadly, as they say, put on the cutting room floor. So, yeah, not great. (laughs) Yeah, and I think with those projects as well is that those ones you can see why it didn't work out and me and Jacob talked before about the Fantastic Four films and you know again I'm not like a fan four stick apologist because you know I, I call it fan four stick but to me again that was such like you know half of that film is like it's not a great film but I never felt that that was like de- it was because Josh Trank was like making a bad film it was just because he was making this vision of a Fantastic Four film that he thought was different or original, which I can't really slate and say, no, that's wrong. Because again, like how then would you have, you know, your Jokers, etc., in which somebody's taken something and go, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to do it this way? And, you know, you take that gamble of whether it'll work or not. In the case of Josh Trank, it didn't work to kind of go with this more supernatural horror vibe for the Fantastic Four. And it just means the half of that film is just uninteresting and not great because, again, you haven't got that. Maybe the casting wasn't right. There's a lot of elements that weren't working. But I think it could have been quite a passable, mediocre film if maybe you had just seen what he had made or it was just not meddled with. But then the last half of that film is, like, completely... That's where it becomes the big joke that it is because you've got an actress there with, like, a blonde, like dodgy blonde wig and this, this, like, action scene thrown in at the end, which is just pure studio meddling and just made it like a horrific sight to see. So, you know, that was one which came to my mind of being like, uh, you can understand what happened and you could understand that like, this is the type of film he wanted to make, but it just, th- this isn't my jam and I can understand why people like it, but personally I don't. It's kind of like with, you know, you were saying, Sophie, with Venom that, you know, you're, you know, I, I enjoy it, but, you know, I understand maybe why other people don't, etc. Just to jump in on the Josh Trank thing, there's a huge problem with with the film industry as a whole is that a lot of people think it's it, it's a good idea to take these really brilliantly cool, talented young directors like Josh Trank's fantastic, Chronicle was phenomenal, and he's had his career ruined. And it's not his fault. And what's happened is these production studios, they I, I'm, we're always blaming the studios again, and I apologise, this is one example of them cocking up, is they take these people who've made a first-time feature and who show potential, and then they throw them onto a big franchise they have no experience making on a scale they're not used to. Of course, they're going to fail. You know, it's it's too much. Some of them fly, and I, and I'm so it's so good to see. But it's a bad idea to take someone like that, and they take these young filmmakers, these first time filmmakers, because they think they can mould them into their own what they want to do, and it's kind of a token gesture grabbing them. But it's not really fair to take someone like Josh Trank and give him Fantastic Four and say reboot the franchise. Go. They're not. He's not experienced enough. He's phenomenal, but and also slight jib here, but you never get a first time female director on those kind of films. <laughs> they have to prove themselves. They have to make at least five. Um, been working for twenty years, but they just grab these young male directors and throw them on and go go, and then they blame them when they mess up, and it's not fair. And he is going to really struggle to work again. And I would love to see more work from him because he's amazing. So it's a change. Yeah. Like, like Rian Johnson again, like with Star Wars again, you know, opinions of that film aside, you know, he can and make, you know, Knives Out, which is fantastic. So it's, it's again showing that, like you said, they quite are often to me as much as, you know, like, I, you know, I enjoy like a lot of The Last Jedi. It's seen very much like a kind of like a hire of like, who he's a hot ticket right now. But it's like, but what, where's the reason for why he should do a Star Wars film? There wasn't like a specific, and the negative side of that is J.J. Abrams, which is of course like, oh, he made Star Trek, which is essentially a Star Wars film. So unless of course hire him. And it's like, why? The, like, you know, if he's already done it, then it doesn't make sense for him to do it again. Kind of thing. I would say that for me, the, the theatrical experience, uh, the big screen is part of the language. Sure. Meaning that uh, the way you shoot, the way you edit, the way you, the movies being scored, the sound design, everything is done thinking about the theatrical environment. And it's just that there's nothing as immersive as the theater experience. And I think that as human beings also, we are not meant to be isolated. We are, it, there's something unmatchable as the communal experience, sharing emotion, being an audience become, become we, we, as humans, I think we need sometimes to become one together and to share and and um, 
there's nothing like cinema to, to go through this experience. And again, cinema is meant to be watched on, on a wide screen. And, and, and for me, it's at the, at the definition of cinema. So it's, in a, voila. We'll end on a fun note. So um, I'm interested now in you guys, if you have our two guests, any ideas of how you would execute a comic book film uh, if you were to go with one of these wild ideas of this is how I'd approach this. And I'm also interested in knowing whether you think it would actually <laughs> go well or not. Like, as I've said in uh, my notes, uh, would it be well received or terribly go terribly wrong on set? A la the room. <laughs> you might be like, people are going to, uh, who said this before? The people are like, people are going to hate this film and like people are not going to like it, but I like it. <laughs> and some a niche audience probably will. I think it was m maybe, was it Snyder or someone said like that? Maybe talking about Justice League, but there's a few films in which you get directors who say that like a lot of people won't like this and that's fine. <laughs> so uh, Rob, what, what's, uh, what's your idea for one that might go great or might go wrong? <laughs> So I'm actually going to pitch something that um, I actually pitched at Comic-Con because uh, it was a question that Mike asked me on... Um, sorry, Michael, I should say. He probably doesn't like Mike, to be fair. Anyway, I just covered myself there. Um, Michael asked me uh, on stage. He put me on the spot because he asked everyone else, oh, yeah, tell me a hero story. Tell me a hero thing that you would do or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. And then he went to me and went, right, if you could take any villain... Um, what would you do and what would the film be? And I'll pitch it now. I would do an Edward Nigma story, but do it in the style of Memento. Nice. <laughs> like where you would literally do a retelling of the Riddler origin story, and um, but you would have to unscramble different pieces of the film and his um, story. For, so you could show the ending first or the, the middle first and the beginning. But, you know, you get the picture where you're literally putting a puzzle together like as if you were the investigator or Batman himself trying to piece together what is the overall riddle that Riddler is trying to give to you, which is his origin story. And I think it would work, but I reckon a studio head would turn around to me and say, what the fuck are you doing? Um, <laughs> that sounds insane, or that just sounds way too complicated, but... You know, that's my pitch for Nigma. So just do it just do yeah. a James Cameron. Like you've got the Joker there as the example, like he did with, you know, the Titanic. Just be like, imagine that boat. Romeo and Juliet on that boat. And then they're like <gasps> just, just you know, you could do that kind of pitch. You know, just imagine this character, but memento. <laughs> they they might they yeah. might go for it. They <laughs> might go for it. Rob just gave a masterclass in pitching, actually. If you can name it in, like, two phrases, that's perfect. Like, another good one at the moment is Midnight Mass on Netflix. And if you just go, vampire priest, you've pitched it. <laughs> you know? so, but you it really, really well, and people want to see that. Like, I have to think that's brilliant. So, yeah, good little mini masterclass on pitching there, Rob. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Didn't people thank say you. that with Squid Game as well? They were like, Parasite, but meets Hunger Games or something like that. It was like people were saying. Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like I like the classic um, Jaws in space. <laughs> yeah. That that's a good one. That's that a, was that's Alien, a, wasn't yeah, it? That's Alien. Yeah. 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 yeah but yeah. you've also got um, Die Hard, but you know, yeah, that's, that's for, for ac action movies. It's yeah, like, it's like Die Hard, but it's in a lift. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Die Hard on a bus. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm I'm always shit at that as well. I'm like, well, it's it's a bit willow, like eighties, but it's also like a seventies, uh, like. Uh, almost famous but then it's a little bit French inspired and everyone's like yeah Sophie you're not doing our money no, no. I can't do it I can't pitch too simply I have too many ideas well Sophie uh, what is your idea then are we <laughs> <laughs> well I, I've made everyone think this is going to be great now haven't I <laughs> well I mean I've, I've definitely not scratched the poison ivy itch enough yet and there still isn't a poison ivy cinematic version so I would still if I could make anything would still be a poison ivy film i'd make her feature i'd make her sort of i'd have her origin in there there's this fantastic comic book and i've got it downstairs and excuse me i can't remember who wrote it but where it starts with her trying to escape her life and go back to nature and just leave her killing behind and just be quiet and be she ends up being worshipped as a goddess in a rainforest and she looks after the rainforest and looks after the the young people that visit her and worship her but it's about escape and leaving your past behind and then the bulldozers come and the you know and blow the place up and kill the young child who's worshiping her and just you know she can't be a goddess she can't have peace and the entire rainforest is destroyed 
And she's always had these amazing environmental messages anyway. And so in this comic book, she then goes back to Gotham and goes and seeks revenge. And it's this idea of someone who doesn't want to be a villain anymore is trying to escape it and is drawn back out of revenge. I find so exciting. So I would make that into this big, epic, modern day to modern taste Poison Ivy feature, but also featuring flashbacks for people who don't know her and showing her origin and how, you know, the whole... I, there's different origin stories for Poison Ivy. I love the Woodrow one. I love the fact that she was abused by a man and so in turn used her sexuality and her power in order to get strength over men as a way of recovery. I find just so inspiring. So I would be also showing that in flashbacks. And it, But I'm aware this all sounds quite depressing. <laughs> and I think I'm probably breaking my own rule of not thinking about the audience. I'm just making the Poison Ivy film that I want to see. So I, I don't know. But I also, I know what a lot of the Poison Ivy fans want to see because they've really got behind Growing Shadows and they've been super supportive and they've loved it. And I worked as many Easter eggs as possible into it for them to pick up on and then they found it and they loved it and, and they chucked money into the, the crowdfunder. So I think I have a good idea of what the Poison Ivy fans want to see. I also know that I won't go too far down this route, but DC has kind of tried to squash Poison Ivy's character a lot lately because she was an eco-terrorist, as is how they used to call her. The problem is nowadays everyone's aware of global warming and, and they can't really see her as a villain anymore because she's kind of right in what, I mean, her methods and killing is not right, but her sticking up for the planet is in fact the right thing to do. So a lot of writers have tried to bury her, like we can't really use her as a villain anymore because she's not wrong. And also the treatment of her amazing relationship with Harley Quinn has kind of been shied away from a bit as well, unfortunately. So I don't know if execs would want to make the same film that I want to make, and I don't know if it would come out right because of what DC want with their canon and what I want might not merge. I think audiences would like it if I make it my way. I don't know if DC would. So. I, I maybe have an idea, Sophie, you could use to convince the execs, which is, again, going with what we said with Rob. So you just have like a flip board and you just flip a page and Greta Thunberg is there and you're like, everyone loves this girl. And like, it's that maybe that picture of her like <laughs> ang angry at Trump, the kind of like, you know, like scrunched face <laughs> and then turn over and people like, everyone loves Wanda from WandaVision. Oh, I love that <laughs> Bring <story>. those together. <laughs> what have you got? <laughs> Throw in a bit of the Me Too movement because everyone's getting behind that and rightly so and you're yeah. in. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or we could just do this. Uh, we could do the, go in with the same presentation and do it like in the end of not the end uh, in um, Love Actually, where you play some music. It's carol singers, and then you have the scientists <laughs> up there drop a sign each <laughs> down yeah. like, with photos. <laughs> and this is the movie we could be making. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great stuff. Well, yeah, I would go watch those two films anyway. They they they, they sound great. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Jake. Jake any sense. thoughts? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all on the same page here as I also want to do a Batman villain. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I think I've talked to you about this, Rob, that I have I pretty much came, with the, came up with the idea that as soon as I saw Joker, that I'd love to see an origin of Mr. Freeze. Mm. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. And I would actually... Yeah. I don't think Warner Brothers or DC would go for this, but my vision is to make it a romantic tragedy. Um, and to really, and almost like a biopic, like really focus on the relationship between Victor and Nora and see that relationship through their life. I feel as if we only get Nora in that sort of machine thing that's keeping her alive. She's not really a character in the Batman mythos, you could say, that interacts with other characters. So make her a real character, make her grow up with Victor and then when she gets this disease, it's this journey of him trying to find the cure to we eventually lead to a moment where he has to work with, um, I would say, Daggett Industries. And within that, we learn about corruption and the corruption of pharmaceutical companies and all of that sort of stuff. So that, that's what I would focus on. And then unfortunately, it ends in a tragedy with him becoming Mr. Freeze in the accident. 
you guys are making the films I want to see. <laughs> I, 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 and yet, and this is what fans want to see because DC has the best villains and amazing tragic stories, and yet they keep giving us Batman origin films. So mm. why is Which, that? I just want to say, it's <laughs> Matt Reeves, you're doing the Lord's work, yeah, though. That it, looks fantastic. It, it, oh, yeah, he's <laughs> it, it could <laughs> lead to, you know, to a good freeze from him. Yeah, we'll have to see. But uh, yeah, I, I think the only one that sort of just crossed my mind, actually, was like we were talking earlier about like X-Men and stuff like that is potentially, I think, that there's so many, like, great characters and X-Men characters, and sometimes back in the day, you were like, oh, why are you making, like, a solo film about them? Like, there's potentially going to be that, like, Magneto origin film and stuff, and obviously the Wolverine ones were always going to do well. But I've always said, and again, I don't know if I'd necessarily pick this character, but this is just the one that skipped in my head, but there are so many just niche and weird mutants, and I think that that's, like, a big allure of them. I I would love the fact that if they re- when they reboot the X-Men that they don't just go with all the big hitters, like, you know, like, oh, Beast, you know, uh, Phoenix, Jean Grey, Cyclops, etc. I think that some of the allure of the X-Men is that you sometimes got these people who are just like, yeah, I've just got this, like, bizarre power. So I think some people are often quite harsh to, like, Jubilee of, like, oh, wh- she shoots fireworks. What a stupid thing to do. It's just, like... So, like, go with that. Do some sort of, like, I don't know, um, is it Booksmart? Is that the, like, some sort of, like, teen drama or something about her, like, having this weird firework power and all these people at school, like, you're lame, you shoot fireworks, and just have it be about that or something like that. Just, like, have it as this kind of, like, indie road film or something about her, like, going along with a bunch of other teenagers and embracing that and kind of being like, yeah, I do shoot fireworks. Screw you. (laughs) You know, and, like, that being, like, you know, the entire idea is just to be, like, it's not the most impressive power, you know, and maybe there's some sort of, like, you know, comparison to people like Cyclops who look amazing when they're on the news and stuff, but she embraces that she's... She's got a niche power and she, you know, that's fine, you know, and I would love to see Disney, at least in, you know, their team, I would love to have them include a character like that in the future. That's why she was so perfect in the in the animated series, which I flipping loved, like the fact that she was a normal, relatable teenager and she was the audience's way in. We talked about characters being relatable and she 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 really was, wasn't she? I, I would see that film as well. That sounds brilliant. But on that matter, what happened to the Gambit film? Yeah, I'd gone? like to see that come back because Channing Tate, <laughs> Channing Tatum seemed passionate about it. Oh. That's what we were saying. You know, you need that passion. He was so pumped for that. I felt bad for him, but uh, maybe someday. We've said that Kevin Feige is very open to ideas. He's kind of a nice guy. So hopefully maybe Channing Tatum will be like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> It's been 84 years. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's been a fun discussion, guys. And, uh, yeah, a great way to wrap things up there. And hopefully a lot of people have got, you know, great insight into how the process works, about how important so many different elements are when you are creating a film. So, you know, thank you all so much for listening to this episode. We appreciate uh, guests such as Rob and Sophie coming on board uh, to discuss all of this kind of geeky stuff with us, but also very important topics and very insightful stuff as well about like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have learned a lot about how it works in the industry, etc. So, uh, you know, Rob, where, where can we find you? Where is, is you know, Crime Alley, etc.? What have you, else have you been getting up to that you want to shout about? Uh, so you guys can reach me at, at Rob Ailing uh, on Instagram or at Rob, uh, Rob Ailing uh, Film on Twitter and um crime alley uh living in crime alley is on youtube uh you can catch it there or if anyone from the united states is listening in you can actually check it out in uh the juggernaut film festival in chicago um or uh in early december where it's going to be playing at los angeles comic con um i have decided to potentially go down there i'm not quite 100 percent sure i'm on the 90 percent kind of cusp um <laughs> depending on how um things go for the, over the next month but that's probably going to be the way that i end the circuit if not just you know let the film do its um thing now um i also have my other films out there now uh, my recent um lockdown short documentary hands is now available to watch on youtube as well and uh as you guys know already but i'm working on my feature film debut as we speak and uh still continuing to write the slate so um watch the space and uh check out my instagram and uh, twitter for more updates yeah hopefully rob doesn't feel too pressured about all the things we've been told by then it's, it's so crucial to have this and he's there making this feature like oh my god <laughs> like it's fine rob you, you t- <laughs> we, you've, you've verified why you're the guy to do this uh so yeah ble- yeah go check those out some amazing stuff over there uh sophie where can we catch yourself 
I Sophie Black Film on Twitter and Instagram. Um, there, my production company is also all over social media, Triscale Pictures, but it's super hard to spell. So, you know, go via me and then find my team and my films via Triscale Pictures that way. Like, yeah, all over the place. And uh, Growing Shadows, a Poison Ivy fan film, is also on YouTube and Vimeo if you like HD. So please go and watch it there. And latest film, Lepidopterist, which I talked about at the start of the podcast, it has got its huge, finally back on the big screen after years of waiting. It's back on the, it's actually physically screening. And we've got the um, our amazing IMAX screening coming up in November at Birmingham Film Festival. At, I've got it written in front of me, 8 o'clock, Tuesday, the 23rd of November at Millennium Point in Birmingham. Please go see Lepidopterist because I've been dying to show this film on a on a screen any big screen but one this big is, is such an honor and uh yes and we are my team and i are also working on a, a new film which we should be shooting in january but i'm going to be one of those assholes and i actually can't say what it is yet because so, it's really exciting and there's some industry backing that i can't announce and i'm dying too so yeah but i'll announce it yeah in january, it's, sure. it's all reason for you to come back on the show that's fine <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you and um, i'm sure jake was just like chomping at the bit there when you mentioned IMAX he was like there's a film I want to mention that's great on IMAX can I please talk about it <laughs> no I, I wasn't I, I was thinking like that's just incredible Sophie that you've managed to get your film on to see it uh, presented in IMAX that is yeah. wow that's it's really exciting but for people who can't you know who aren't comfortable going to big screens yet and that's fine and also people in america it's also going to be showing as part of colorado international sci-fi and fantasy film festival from next month which it, they are staying online for now so that's another way to, to grab the film so you don't have to come all the way to Birmingham for the big screen but please do i'll be there we'll have fun but you know if you can't you can see it online as well that way sounds amazing i would love to see that on imax like i said it's such a and you've you've meant as you've mentioned so many times before, you know in this you know recording there's you know supporting cinema any way you can is just a you know a fantastic thing to do right now to support the industry uh for ourselves you know you can find us uh, over on twitter and facebook at capes cars and masks uh, you can find myself at david osgar o-s-g-a-r on twitter and on letterbox uh, jake where can we catch yourself yeah, you can also find me on Twitter at Sweaty Jake and on Letterbox at Jake Hart. And yes, support cinemas. Go see June, people. <laughs> he got it in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do echo that. Go see June. It is uh, worth seeing, definitely on the big screen. As oh, as I said on Twitter, it should be a cri- like crime to not watch it <laughs> on the big screen. If anybody watches that on a phone for the first time, like, oh my god, what? What are you doing? <laughs> but <laughs> if it's on HBO Max, I suppose it you know gives Warner Brothers what they want. But yeah, um, you know, for this podcast, uh, whether you use Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, please do subscribe and follow us on any of those outlets as well. If you're on Apple, leave us a rating and a review, as it all helps us to go up in the rankings so you know the best thing you could do is also recommend us to your geeky friends and expand the family of capes cowls and masks so thank you for listening we'll see you all next time and stay safe everyone see you around bye-bye let the spice flow <laughs>